All right, I think it started. Hello. Um, hi, uh, my name is Douglas Williamson. Um, just to have a, a quick check out there in, um, in webinar land, if you can hear me, um, just go ahead and write in the chat a yes or a little plus sign, just so that I know that you're receiving me properly. Excellent, okay, thank you. Thank you, it seems that people can hear me just fine. That is good news. So, um, good morning from Germany. Um, I don't exactly know where everybody else in the world is. Potentially it's the afternoon. Um, potentially it's very, very early in the morning or late at night if you're really a big fan of uh, the, uh, the Collective Leadership Institute. Maybe you've gotten up in the middle of the night to join us. I hope that's the case. <laughs> My name is Douglas Williamson, and I will be facilitating this webinar today with my colleague, Lulekwa Kiba, who is going to join us from South Africa. Um, and I just want to welcome you to today's webinar, where we're going to be introducing the Dialogic Change Model, which is one of the Collective Leadership Institute's two primary methodologies for teaching uh, and training people in stakeholder collaboration and transformational change processes. Um, the, uh, this webinar is just a little bit of a foretaste of the, um, the dialogic change model, and it's just meant to give um, a little bit of an idea of what the model is about um, and how we have used it uh, in the past uh, and presently in certain uh, initiatives and projects. Um, and it is um, the methodology that we go into in much more depth in our Art of Stakeholder Collaboration One course, which we offer with regular frequency here in Germany, in South Africa, and also um, in Cambodia. So um, just to, to give you a little bit of an introduction about myself, um, I am one of the managing partners of the Collective Leadership Institute. I'm from New York City originally, but I'm stationed now here in Germany at Potsdam at the um, offices of the Collective Leadership Institute um, have a background in sustainable development and international relations, as well as in facilitation, education, communication, and in entertainment, my previous career in the theater and film. Um, so I would like to just get started very quickly. Um, I will introduce my colleague Lulekwa um, in a moment um, because she is going to give us a brief introduction, but first I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Collective Leadership Institute. Um, so the Collective Leadership Institute, it's an independent nonprofit organization based, based here in Potsdam, where I'm stationed, and also in Cape Town, South Africa. And we also have associates in other parts of the world, including the United States and Senegal and Cambodia as well. Um, we support stakeholders from, from different sectors and implementing and creating collaborative change initiatives for um, sustainable solutions to, to challenges. And that is the sort of core of the work that we do in using this dialogic change model to help people move their, uh, their processes forwards towards sustainability and success. Um, just a little vision, we empower future-oriented people to lead collectively towards a sustainable future and believe in the cooperation and, and collectively created solutions. Um, the mission is building collaboration competence and also, more than that, a culture of collaboration for sustainability by empowering people to use the methodology of collective leadership for sustainability um, and our dialogic change model. And this fosters communities for dialogic change towards sustainability. And we also are, are, are trying to develop into a center of gravity for collective leadership globally. Um, all right, I would like now, before we get right into the dialogic change model, just to say also that the Collective Leadership Institute and the work that we do is very much collect connected to a global sustainability movement and the sustainable development goals um, of which the 17th is about partnership is really the goal that we tend to focus on. We do work across sectors, and you'll see that um, in the examples that we give today in this webinar when we're talking about the different phases of the dialogic change model. Um, but we work really in, in a wide variety of, of sectors 
and different initiatives which cover um, a pretty full spectrum of the sustainability, uh, sustainable development goals. So uh, we work in, in natural resources, we work on hunger and gender issues, we work on employment and economic issues, supply chain issues and so forth. Um, and we've worked as well very much um, across sectors. We work uh, predominantly with the public sector, but we also work um, a lot with nonprofit organizations and uh, increasingly more with the private sector. So um, before um, moving on I, uh, to the dialogue change model, I'd like to um, introduce my colleague who's joining us today from South Africa, Lulekwa Gikiba. And I'm going to um, introduce her. Hopefully um, she is going to pop onto the screen and we will see her and hear her momentarily. Um, let's see how it works. So, Lulekwa, could you just speak and see if we can hear you? Okay, not hearing Lulekwa yet, although I do see her screen. So, we cannot hear you yet. Okay, hopefully Lulekwa will come online momentarily. Just what we had dreamed of as a nightmare, the, the lack of connection. Um, Lulekwa, um, we're seeing, I'm seeing a little bit of your screen, but I'm not getting your, your audio feed um, or your video feed at the moment. And I think nobody can hear you anywhere else either. Um, Lulekwa, um, maybe you can um, just step out and come back in again, and that will that will help. Trying very hard to get Lulekwa into the into the module here. Lulekwa, can can you speak up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We had a test yesterday and now it seems to be not working. Wait. No. Oh no, what a mess. Let's see if Lulekwa will come back in. Try again. Lulekwa, are you there? Still nothing. Okay. Um, Lulekwa, I'm going to, to, to leave you in, but I think what I will try and do is I will try and uh, do your presentation for you. Um, not what I had expected, unfortunately, but um, uh, I don't exactly know what to do um, other than, than try and continue in your stead, um, which is unfortunate. Um, we're having this technical problem right now. Um, so, that's why I'm going to continue in your stead. I'm going to try, continue to try to, to come into to this webinar, uh, but for the moment, I think that I will just press ahead and do the best that I can um, in introducing the dialogic change model and the different phases uh, that Lulekwa and I had actually planned to, to share, uh, to share again, but um, it has not. It, it seems that I will get to do everything. Um, and Lulekwa will continue to try to, to come into the, 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 the module. All right, so I'm going to continue, and I'm sorry about that delay. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of the dialogic change model, 
Um, the dialogic change model follows um, a, a human, ancient human knowledge of dialogue. Um, this is part of, um, part of our history as a species. We have developed the, the ability to communicate and uh, to solve problems together many, many eons ago. Um, the, uh, the, the dialogic change model is based on many years of the Collective Leadership Institute's experience in working on change processes and also inspired by the works of several other thinkers such as Bill Isaacs and Peter Garrett, Otto Scharmer and Adam Kahane through their approach to change. Um, the model provides a guided approach to preparation and implementation of stakeholder dialogues and collaboration. Um, it, 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 it also allows for a result-oriented and structured planning and implementation of a stakeholder dialogue in four phases. And we're going to touch, or I guess I'm going to touch on those four phases today on my own. Um, and the dialogue change model is very much a, a process competence model, um, which focuses on the relational aspects of building up um, a, a change process. And finally, there are guiding questions for each of the four phases. I don't think we'll be sharing those with you. Those are really uh, part of uh, the, the pedagogy for our stakeholder one course, stakeholder collaboration one course. But um, these guiding questions really help to draw attention to aspects that, that require attention uh, during the uh, different phases, the four different phases of the dialogic change model. Um, so here you can actually see the model. This is how we developed it as, as a kind of spiral. And the reason that we developed it as a spiral and not as a line nor as a circle is that, um, as you can see, that in phase one, it really starts on the interior. And um, I'll be talking about that in a moment. Um, and I think that probably everybody in here is familiar with uh, basic project management tools. And a lot of them are built in a linear fashion. Uh, the reason we've developed this in this sort of spiral, in a growing spiral fashion, is that um, we don't actually see um, the collaboration stopping, hopefully, that um, when we get to a phase four, which is really the, the last phase in this model, uh, we're really hoping that the first three phases where you've built up a collaboration system, where you've formalized things, and then where you've actually implemented what you said you're going to do, spins off into something that's larger, greater, that's scaled up, um, or potentially that just takes the, the collaboration culture that's been created during the, the process and spins it off into to something new and positive. Um, and I'll be getting more, more detailed about all of these four phases in, in a moment. All right, so the dialogic change model in phase one. Um, phase one, uh, I think, and I think that most, uh, most of us in CLI believe that uh, the phase one is the most important phase. Of course, all the phases are, are, are very important, but to really establish um, a solid collaboration system that's going to bring any multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral, or collaboration initiative forwards, um, the first phase really provides the, the bedrock foundation on which uh, a successful collaboration initiative can be, can be created. Um, this is, uh, as you see now, just focusing on the, the first phase, which we call exploring and engaging. Um, we have three different parts that, we're, that I'll talk about just a little bit, where we create resonance, um, which is really about um, getting your stakeholder system, or at least the core stakeholder system, excited um, and interested in the initiative. Um, then there, there's also understanding the context, which to a certain degree um, uh, is about understanding who the stakeholders in the system are, as well as what different factors are, are affecting the uh, change initiative. And then also we have this third thing, which is called building a container for change. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about building a container for change, but that's sort of building a core stakeholder group. Okay. So in the phase one, the, just a little overview. And, and as, I, as I said before, we're really only getting to give you 
a very, very little taste of the dialogic change model today. Um, and, and also, just to, to let you know, um, after I go through the, the four phases, uh, there'll be a little bit of a Q&A and, um, and discussion if we, if we have the time. I'm sure we have the time. Um, I've left plenty of time for, for that today, and it's just a brief presentation. But let's go into phase one. So in, in phase one, as you see, it's understanding the context, getting the different viewpoints of, of stakeholders and engaging them in preparatory conversations, raising energy for the action. That's what I said before about uh, resonance uh, and really building that case for change. Uh, the duration can be from two months for one stakeholder dialogue, and just setting it up, uh, to way over a year, depending on, on the circumstances um, for really bringing um, a, a stakeholder system together um, to, to work on, uh, on moving a, a transformative change or change process or multi-stakeholder dialogue forwards. Um, some of the results that we expect from a phase one are, are trust among the key stakeholders, um, having that resonance for the initiative, um, having the credibility built within that core group for making the implementation and um, for getting the different um, stakeholders, at least the stakeholder system, uh, mapped out and identified, uh, and also having the different context and, and factors that influence the, um, the initiative are explored. And so one of the things that we like to say is, um, was a principle is we like to get the system the collaboration system into a conversation with itself. And that's really about creating the space for, for fruitful dialogue, which is generative, which is um, directed towards um, outcomes. And um, that, I think, is, is such a key aspect of, of, of the foundation of building a stakeholder system. Um, another uh, thing that I mentioned before was building this container. And, and that container is something also which it, we believe is, is absolutely necessary in building uh, a change initiative, is having a core sector group, um, or a cross-sector core group. Um, and I'm sorry, there's a typo there. It should be group, not groups, um, which is committed to moving that, that initiative forwards. Um, having that container as a sort of um, initial fractal of collaboration for moving forwards uh, a, a, a multi-stakeholder change initiative is vital for maintaining that uh, energy at the core and the motivation for moving the process forwards. And, um, and building relationships, of course, is really, is really vital at this stage, in the beginning stage. It's important, we believe, that people know each other formally and informally, that um, all the voices uh, are heard, that there's participation and inclusion, that there's contact amongst people, that they're meeting each other as human beings, not just as adversaries or, or just as professionals. Um, that aspect of, of building um, the beginnings of a stakeholder system are really important for that foundational aspect of the dialogic change model and for change initiatives. All right, now I want to talk a little bit about a case um, that um, is a pretty recent case for us, and it's sort of still ongoing, but um, it was a case in Tunisia um, in which um, uh, several colleagues were working on a change initiative in a province called Kairouan. And this is, uh, if you're aware of the situation in Tunisia, um, there's a lot of challenges to working in Tunisia. They just had a revolution. They've changed a lot of systems. Um, there are uh, some serious uh, trust deficits uh, in, in the country. And, um, and they have some, some very serious challenges as well, um, environmentally and economically. Um, and the challenge that uh, CLI was um, there to address was to address water users. Um, in this particular province um, in, in, uh, in Tunisia, in sort of south, sort of central south Tunisia, not really all that south, but south of, of the coast and of Tunis. 
um, where there was a challenge of um, using water in a, in a sustainable way. And the initiative tried to bring together the users, who are mostly agriculturalists, farmers, together to, with a local administration, regional and national um, public sector um, uh, staff and, and administrators. Um, there was a very serious lack of trust and CLI used the DCM in the phase one uh, and it took about a year and a half to actually build a stakeholder system uh, that was strong enough for, for this trust to be established, for resonance in the project to be, um, to be established um, so that this project could move forwards. Um, this was a, a great challenge and um, the, the DCM was broken into sort of the, the first phase was broken into three different uh, parts for this particular phase of this project. First of all, there was a, um, a capacity deficit amongst the, the farmers and the agriculturalists in, uh, in, in being able to have a dialogue. So first of all, um, the CLI really had to train people in how to have good conversations and how to be in a generative dialogue. Uh, that was the, the first step. And the second step was starting to, to have the different sectors talk amongst themselves. The administration at a national level had to have a conversation, but they were much more advanced, at least in dialogue skills, uh, than the water users. So first bringing the water users together, and having them start to have a, a dialogue amongst themselves, as well as a dialogue amongst the different levels of the administration. And then after those phases were, 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 were conducted, um, the entire system came together at a water forum. And that water forum, to actually get those people together, and there were many challenges in getting them together, eventually it happened after more than a year and a half of putting together this collaboration system um, at this water forum, which took place uh, last, last year, um, Finally, there was a consensus to, to move forwards together. There was enough trust and resonance uh, and an enthusiasm in this project. And the, they signed together um, a water charter uh, to move this process forwards. And it's still moving forwards at, as we speak now. So uh, just a little, a little bit of a graphic from this process. Um, here you can see, and it's in French, apologies um, if you don't speak French, but uh, this is, you can basically have an idea here from, from the way this, this came together. So you have the different uh, administrative levels on the top, sort of the top three, and they've come together, and on the bottom, the different water users who had to learn how to talk together, and then this sort of second level where they were talking um, amongst themselves, um, and then the water forum at the end. And it's just a little process graphic which shows the, the flow of things. But it looks quite simple. It took uh, more than a year and a half for that to actually come together. All right. And let's see if, if there's um, one last chance to see if Lulekwa can come in, um, if she's here. And I'll see if she's here and I can get her into the, I don't even see her now. It's a shame. So Lulekwa is, is, is no longer available. So I'm going to try to present uh, Lulekwa's cases um, on her behalf. Um, I definitely won't be able to do, do it justice. Um, this was um, uh, part, of, part of, uh, uh, of her work. She was doing this work um, on her own uh, with one of our other colleagues in, um, in, uh, in Zambia, and this is the case that she's going to present. But let me bring you a little bit through the dialogic change model phase two. So in the phase two, and here you can see where we're building and formalizing. And this phase really, it's about um, clarifying goals um, and, and making a common plan and starting to plan how you're going to bring this forwards. And towards the end of that phase two, it's really about um, establishing agreements, whether they be terms of reference or, uh, or really um, uh, solid project plans for moving things forwards. Um, and commitments to, to moving the, the project or multi-stakeholder um, initiative to, to the implementation phase. Um, this, uh, this phase, um, is, hello? I've 
lost my PowerPoint. Here we go. So, clarifying the sheets available, there are a lot of process planning and, and the joint implementation planning. And the duration of this phase two, it, it can be very, very fast, depending on, on whether uh, it's really a small uh, objective or a, or, or a little objective that the, the multi, the different stakeholders are trying to accomplish, or to several months, because this is, uh, if you've established in a good phase one, where you've really put all your stakeholders together, they've agreed to work together, and there's a good energy. Um, the second phase of really deciding what, uh, what is it that you're going to do together, um, and really clarifying what are those common goals. It could be a series uh, of workshops or a series of meetings uh, with relevant stakeholders. And the results uh, that are expected, um, depending, as I said, on the purpose and the form of this dialogue and what the initiative is, um, it could just be something that shows commitment and gives structures to move forward, or it could be something that's uh, really much more detailed. Um, and here we have just a few things that it could be like recommendation and clarity on, on the use of the dialogues or agreements to collaborate, um, activity and project plans, and agreement or implementation procedures, and formal structures to, uh, to steer the process, which could be for something which is a larger initiative whether they be committees or working groups or task forces or whatever you would like to call them. Um, some mistakes that happen in the phase two. Um, oftentimes, and I, I think that probably we've all seen this happen um, with uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives is that people rush to, to move them forwards before they're really ready, before they've established the relational ground uh, groundwork for for collaborating together effectively. Um, and I think that happens quite frequently. Uh, people rush into agreements without the operational commitment of the partners. Um, sometimes you might have, uh, there's an absence of a joint problem or situational diagnosis. Um, the design of the process uh, might not really be, uh, have been done in an inclusive or participatory manner. Um, and oftentimes we see as well that there's an over focus on technical and legal and structural issues instead of on building the collaboration and the dialogue, which is the process management, the relationship management, and continuing to build trust and resonance. Um, and finally, uh, there may be an insufficient amount of time for taking into account existing rules and regulations and procedures. All right, some principles in phase two, find the common ground. Uh, that's really important. Um, you may think, okay, this could happen in phase one. Um, in phase one, if you have you, your core stakeholder group, but in phase two, when you have a wider group of stakeholders, um, it, it's important to identify what that common ground is. Um, and it's important to, to continue to come back to that, reiterate um, what that common goal is. And in that second phase as well, where you have a wider group of stakeholders, it's then important to, to really plan how things are going to move forward, to develop ownership, and to discuss together the goal, goals and the vision for the initiative. Um, okay, yes, yeah, so um, I, I mentioned these a little bit, and I'm, I'm also sensing that I wanna move forward in time, so uh, I'm just gonna skip this now and try and move over to this example um, of the Lusaka Water Security Initiative, which Lulekwa, who is, uh, has been, uh, is unfortunately unable to join us today, um, was working uh, on this initiative last year. Um, and this is part of um, a project uh, or a program run by GIZ called the International Water Stewardship Program. And one of the pilot projects that they were working on was in in Lusaka and the Collective Leadership Institute accompanied this process uh, for the last uh, last year and uh, is continuing to work on it. Um, so just to let you know, Lucy, the Lusaka Water Stewardship or Water Security Initiative, I believe, what's it called again? I've forgotten. Water Security Initiative, sorry. Um, so this is a multi-stakeholder partnership. The public sector is involved, private sector and civil society are all involved. Um, 
with the objective of improving water security in Lusaka. Um, it was established based on the realization that there was just an overly complex set of issues threatening. Okay, um, look, I, I just got a message that Lulek one may be trying to rejoin us. Let's see if I can get her in here. That would be great. All right, Lulekwa, I've added you as a moderator. Can you speak? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Can other people hear Lulekwa? Yes. All right, ah, that's brilliant. Okay. Okay, so All Lulekwa, right. I would um, like to allow you then to, um, to introduce Lucy. Um, I've gone through phase two, but maybe you could just continue from Lucy and then we'll continue from there. That's okay. Does that sound good? All right. Thank you, Douglas. Okay. So um, with regards to phase two of the dialogic change model, we thought that we would introduce um, the Lucy um, initiative, which is um, Lusaka Water um, Security Initiative. Um, a project under the umbrella of GIZ, um, International Water Stewardship Program. So when um, CLI um, went into this partnership with IWAS and therefore with um, the Lucy project, it was already um, at the beginning too. So when we went there, there was already an extensive consultation process that had taken place, which we could then attribute it to as the phase one of the DCM. So the overarching goal of um, CLI within this project was to contribute, you know, our expertise in collective leadership and also change expertise and take the initiative from um, its um, beginning stages to where it could be um, um, in operation. So as we like saying at the Collective Leadership Institute that with phase two, that is when your processes are going live. So um, we were working closely with the um, Lucy Secretariat which is currently in transition. It was um, at GIZ at that point. And the initiative itself had already started talking about governance, you know, like um, the allocation of roles, you know, who will have what roles, or the roles that were actually needed for the initiative in order for it to be able to meet um, its, its goals. So there is the Lucy Secretariat, um, which we were working with directly, provided, providing strategic support. And then the Lucy Initiative had um, a focal point team, which was made up of uh, members who had expertise in terms of what the initiatives wanted to focus on within water security in Lusaka. And then there's also the board. So for each and every structure, we see that it is always important that there is some form of um, a committee or a board that makes sure that um, the initiative is carrying its mandate. So this is the example of um, uh, the phase two. But what we also found interesting and the, the report back that we received from uh, the partners of this initiative was that what was encouraging for them was um, the collaborative nature of this initiative, how the members were involved in planning the future together, because that is also something that we stress um, when you are setting up these stakeholder dialogues or when you're trying to work on a big partnership um, um, initiative. So the, that's the feedback that we received that um, the, the collaborative nature, you know, the, the consultations and how each and every member or partner could see clearly what was it that they were contributing towards um, the initiative and the project and the process building up to it. 
Um, let's see. So I think I have captured that. And so when we um, go through the four phases of the dialectic change model, we are only talking about, um, you know, so when we come together into these partnerships, we bring in different organizations, we bring in sometimes um, different you know, interests or different viewpoints. So it is always important at that beginning stages to really come together and talk about the kind of vision that you are having as a partnership project or the kind of vision that you are having as um, this initiative. So towards you know the end of phase two when we were discussing so what will lucy look like what is really lucy working towards so um our friends um in zambia were kind enough to let us use this for the purposes of this webinar so this is what came out um from those beginning workshops where we were doing consultative work so this is what they have. Um, Lucy wants to contribute toward um, a water security for all um, in Lusaka, um, not only to contribute to the health of Lusaka, but to also a prosperous city. As you might know at the moment is that Southern Africa is currently experiencing um, drought with also South Africa and especially Cape Town um, severely affected. For example, in Cape Town, right at this moment, we are happy today that we have rain because we only have about 85% of clean water left in our dams. So um, there's also some similarities between Cape Town and Lucy. So Lucy wants to see and um, wants to strengthen multi-stakeholder collaboration in Lusaka. And what's also good about that is that the private sector there is also coming, um, you know, to, to the board saying, what can we do? You know, we want to get involved. So the Lucy Secretariat um, colleagues were also um, lucky, but also they really worked hard. So Douglas would have mentioned already, you know, what is um, entailed in the phase one where you create resonance, where you try to put together, you know, a good container and also where you're trying to understand the context. So they did so well in that phase in so much that um, there was a good response from government, but there was also a good response from civil society and there was also a good response um, from the private sector. They even have um, a close working relationship with um, the Zambian um, Chamber of Commerce, which is also wanting to contribute to this. And um, we will stop there for phase two, and I would like to hand back to um, Douglas, my colleague, to take us through the following phase. Okay, Lekwa, um, thank you for, for uh, introducing the phase two and for telling us about your experience with Lucy. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about the phase three and um, just so that uh, you don't, uh, for all you participants and listeners, uh, so you don't have the idea that we only work on water issues. Uh, this is definitely not the case, although we have had a lot of good experience working on, on water issues. I'm going to talk about a slightly different case here, but um, just to walk you through a little bit of phase three. Um, the phase three is really where we where we say the rubber hits the road, um, which is an, an, an American idiom, meaning this is where um, the implementation, we're actually doing things really starts. Um, and the, the project goals um, and initiative goals that are set and formalized in phase two, this is really when they get carried out um, in phase three. Um, certainly during the phase three, um, there, it, it's a very high reliance on communication and that um, if there has been a good phase one and phase two, um, part of phase two as well is establishing some of those communication mechanisms, but it really is important that transparency and communication are kept strong in phase three. Um, 
important as well is to celebrate the results. Um, we have to implement, but also don't forget that it's important to celebrate the results. And so um, CLI often recommends that um, it, in the phase three, it's really important to reach for some low-hanging fruits at first, um, just to get some quick wins. And then also it's important in phase three to establish some learning mechanisms. All right, give you a little bit more walkthrough. So um, in the phase three, we're agreed, we're implementing what we've agreed upon in phase two. We're also making some showing off what we've done and evaluating what it is that we've done. So hopefully we will have set some standards, some benchmarks, and it's important that in, in, in the implementation phase in phase three, that we're trying to meet those standards that we've set. Um, this can take, of course, depending on, on what the project or initiative is, can take several months to many years. Um, uh, certainly for a, a multi-year initiative, uh, there should be regular meetings for reviewing, um, and of course stakeholders that are affected should, should, be, should be included in that. The expected results, depending on the form and the purpose again, um, are showcasing those successes and achieving the milestones, um, creating reports, showcasing what, uh, what's actually been accomplished, um, and communication not only internally amongst the stakeholders and implementers, but also externally. And those monitoring systems, as I mentioned, really getting those uh, benchmarks and, um, and some kind of evaluating system to, to allow for the implementers to know if they're achieving what they set out to do. Um, I think I basically hit, hit all these already. Um, and just to sort of some mistakes that we noticed which are quite frequent in phase three. Um, we do notice that the phase three is where a lot of the time we have a crisis. Um, um, it's frequent that uh, in phase one and phase two where it's mostly talking before you get to implementing, people are, are more than willing to to say, sure, we'll do it, and when it gets to implementing, they, they draw back. And this can cause crises, and so at the phase three implementation, we notice that this um, can be often a moment for saying, okay, did we really do an adequate job in phase one and phase two, uh, or do we need to go back? Do we need to reevaluate if we've included all the stakeholders or if the right stakeholders are involved? Um, so this can happen sometimes, or it can, it can become apparent um, by a lack of a proper process management um, or insufficient communication. Um, sometimes there are plans which are simply just too ambitious um, and the sort of larger unachievable or not unachievable, really large goals are pursued predominantly instead of going for some quick wins. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I think I mentioned pretty much um, uh, the, other, the other things here. In this, uh, in this particular uh, phase, some of the challenges. And, and I just want to very briefly introduce um, a case that CLI got to work on, which was called the African Cacho Initiative. And uh, that's actually now, uh, it's moved from um, a successful phase three and sort of into a phase four. But in 2009 to 2010, uh, the Collective Leadership Institute um, was advising and guiding this process in, uh, in uh, five African countries. Um, and it was implemented by the German government, uh, by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and by some private sector partners. And the objective of this initiative was to increase, uh, increase the competitiveness for uh, small holder cashew farmers in, and cashew producers in, in five African countries. And if I'm not mistaken, they were Mozambique, Benin, Mali, Ghana, and one other. Um, I, 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 I've lost it. But in any case, um, in, in, in 2009 to 2012, um, there was a very strong phase one and two, and it led into a phase three success. Um, so along the value chain in, in these African countries, uh, there was a significant increase in um, in, um, in livelihoods, in income for the producers, um, which, um, which was the objective that was set in the phase two of, of, this, uh, of this particular uh, project. Um, 
So this, the Collective Leadership Institute, which was guiding this process in the implementation phase, um, really was looking for a higher buy-in um, at all levels of government, and that was achieved in the phase three. And that process, as I said, is continuing today. Um, there are and have been regular reports and learning events. And actually, this um, entire initiative, which was um, scaled up to, uh, it's actually changed its name now, and I think it's called the Competitive Cashew Initiative um, in the sort of a, a, a different phase, so it moved into a phase four, but it actually won the, the OECD's um, Development Assessment Committee Prize in 2015. And I think that that, that kind of an implementation success um, where it was really shown that the, um, this project or program made a significant impact um, was rewarded in 2015. Um, and, and I think that um, it was definitely something which occurred because of the strong phases in one and two. But then, of course, it, the implementation was effective enough um, in the phase three in communicating the results and achieving what it set out to do um, and in celebrating those successes um, on its website um, and, and in publications that uh, this initiative um, could really be called a success in the phase three. Um, and just a couple of things that, that, um, that I've learned about the successes in the implementation phase, um, and these successes are really taken uh, more, from more recent successes on the website, because I think as when CLI was working in this project in, to, in this sort of 2009-2011 phase, uh, there were about 250,000 farmers who were trained, um, and there was an increase in the yield because of that training, and there was also an increase in, in, in their income. The numbers that are cited on this, on this page, I think, are more, from, more recently from the, the website, which you, can, uh, which you can visit, I believe, still under africancashewinitiative.org. Um, so um, I would like now to pass it back to Lulekwa uh, to go back to um, phase four now and to tell us uh, a little bit more about that. So, Lulekwa, I'm going to add you once more into the room, and hopefully we can hear you well. Lulekwa, are you there? Okay, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, good. All right, okay. Um, so, before I just jump into phase four, I would like to just take one minute and emphasize a little point that of a container, which Doug has mentioned earlier. The container, you might say, um, in lack of a better um, example at the moment, is that is the glue that holds the multi-stakeholder you know, uh, process that's taking place. And because the container is doing so much work, usually what we see that um, the positions that are held by the people in the container, it's like the technical staff, for example, or maybe, you know, um, project leaders. But the, the container also answers usually to, um, you know, a principal. In this case, maybe it might be the CEOs, or the executive directors, etc., of these different partners that are part of an initiative. So what we usually see is that those high-level people are not always able to meet regularly, as the container would do. And therefore, um, the container then would report, let's say, back to them that this is where the process is, or they would report to them in seeking maybe a stamp of approval for something, but also the container is representative of the partnership. So the container is also responsible to make sure that whatever is uh, happening or whatever needs to be done with regards to um, the stakeholder dialogue, it goes back to everyone that needs to be receiving um, that message. Yeah. So, um, and then coming into phase four, um, CLI's experience um, with its work has seen uh, projects that end at phase three. So that is fine. It could be that maybe for the purposes of a particular project, 
they work up until phase three. But we have also seen projects when they are on phase three, they then decide, you know, this has worked so well in this area. How about we take it further? So phase four deals with um, that ask aspect of um, a collaboration. When you decide to take your work to the next level, when you decide perhaps to, let's say, maybe institutionalize it, because maybe when you started, um, it was sort of like a semi-informal setup, but now that you have gone through the lessons and you know how this particular um, um, implementation worked and then you decide that, ah, let's uh, perhaps develop this further or some people might call it you first start with a pilot and depending on the results of that pilot and then you, um, you escalate. So um, the, the objective of this um, phase, phase four, is to make sure that the collaboration or the dialogue is being taken to the next level. You are either expanding or um, you are creating a long lasting structures for change. And our example for this, it's gonna show us that. So we are usually asked, so you know, how long does this take? Um, you know, how long does this phase take? It, it also depends, and sometimes it is also dependent, say, on the legal requirements, for example, of a particular country, because maybe now you decided that, okay, this initiative should actually be an actual organization that is registered. It also depends on, you know, who is now still available to be a partner in this initiative. Um, the expected results here, depending on the form of a stakeholder dialogue and also the area of implementation. So um, it's extending the goal, as we said earlier, institutionalizing, but also using the experience that has been gathered from the previous phase three, phase two, and phase one in another um, area. So um, what we have seen in terms of, you know, those key areas that we need to take note of is that um, sometimes we don't spend enough time in building a proper container, say, for, for the next round. Um, and what we also recommend is that uh, as much as we try to be realistic, because maybe at the end of a project, you know, some people might have moved on to other organizations. So it is important that, for example, your knowledge management process were really um, functioning so that the next container that is uh, driving the second part of the process knows exactly what were the issues, um, what worked, what didn't work, or what is it that the project should focus on. Um, what we have also seen is that the engagement process is usually rushed, and also the integration, say, of new stakeholders is also done in a very rush, rush job, because we think that, you know what, we succeeded. So we don't need to spend time on this. So engagement, 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 it is important that um, you spend, you know, um, time in that engagement. And sometimes it might not necessarily mean time as in the length, but how you engage, for example, with those new stakeholders that are coming in so that they know exactly um, what is the common goal, so that they know exactly what will be expected of them, so that they know exactly what role they will be playing. Um, so we have also seen that um, the contextual needs or requirements of um, an institutionalized uh, structure is not met. Here, if you decide that we were just, um, you know, a semi-informal initiative, but now we want to become an organization, perhaps um, get services of, um, let's say, a consultant, that is um, 
that specializes in these sort of things where they can tell you, you know, these are the requirements that you need to meet in terms of governance, in terms of the legal, the legal um, requirements, things like, um, you know, uh, um, revenue services, for example, depending on what um, are the requirements for that particular country. Um, this may, might seem as, you know, obvious, but it is not always obvious. So you continue to provide clarity, you know, in terms of how everyone um, mandate from their particular organizations is actually aligned to, um, you know, let's say the goal and the objectives of this particular project that is bringing us together. Some stakeholders, we see that they usually just drop off from these processes because maybe they feel that this doesn't align with what I do um, in my organization. And I feel that it is, you know, another addition to my, um, to my job or to, you know, the things that I do at work and therefore I don't get how I should maybe come and spend my time here. So you continue to provide clarity that as the, the, these numbers of partners that are coming together, this is how we are connected to the bigger goal and this is what each and every partner is uh, bringing along. We have also seen that um, when you are also replicating this um, um, uh, part of the project is that you might need to adjust the strategy. Perhaps it might now be five years after, you know, the initial um, work of this project and therefore the context might have changed. So this will affect your strategy in terms of how it is put together. So you also spend time, you know, that container then will see, okay, how do we adjust um, this strategy to make sure that it is aligned with the current context. Um, so um, with regards to the phase four, I am going to use the example of the Lusaka Water Security Initiative because we felt that it um, fits in well. So um, the um, part of the feedback that we were given was that, you know, after this um, year partnership where Douglas, myself, and another colleague we were working, so um, the, the partners felt that you know, the team was really strengthened. Lucy, as this multi-stakeholder initiative, um, was strengthened and also there was an increased um, respect for one another and everyone was now working towards the common goal, knowing exactly what role they had to play and how their individual organizations were actually part of this um, initiative. But there was also now this increased um, commitment, you know, um, to applying this dialogic and collective leadership approach because they, they saw it. When we were working with them, either in looking at, you know, the, the four function areas that the initiative is focusing on, how, you know, that had to be um, carried through. So the partners had a taste and experience of what that felt like and therefore they were also able to have a front row seat to, you know, the result of taking um, such uh, positions. And therefore, they were like, ah, so this could work. We really want to do this. And some were even confident enough to say, um, my organization is happy to pledge, you know, X number of, you know, um, dollars towards this initiative or this is what we would like to contribute um, in terms of finances or in terms of expertise or in terms of our time or in terms of equipment. So the process also leading up to that, as you remember in phase two, we were saying that um, that's when you know things were going live. So Lucy as an initiative, as an initiative um, was now made official 
um, with a representative from the presidency. Um, there was an official launch. And also, the, the, the current board moved to say that, um, you know, the, the secretariat will now move from GIZ to NUASCO, which is um, also a partner within the initiative and it's a Zambian partner. So what is interesting there is that also that the partners are committed to um, taking ownership, you know, of this phase or ownership of this initiative. So even if GIZ, um, you know, uh, ventures, let's say, to other areas in the future, but the Lucy initiative will remain with the people of um, Zambia. And a formal board will be announced soon. And um, also the onward process now, which is um, replicating what was learned through and also taking in um, some new stuff and also uh, partnering um, with other initiatives like this, all of that will be carried through towards the strategy that the partners themselves actually put um, together. So we thought that would be um, a nice example of, um, you know, showing that what happens when um, a partnership has gone through the three phases and is now going to um, a phase four. So um, as I said to one of the participants in this webinar um, later that our book is quite extensive. So each phase has a checklist that helps um, whoever is driving a particular partnership to make sure that, you know, to see have we done enough of this? Have we done enough of that? Are we now able to say we can confidently move our project to the next um, phase? So you will see here in the presentation that um, we have just gave you a sample of what, um, you know, these questions might be. You know, there's also questions about ownership. And that question of ownership also came when there was a discussion of um, where the Lucy Secretariat would be, um, would be held. So people were asking that, okay, we want to take ownership of this, but are we going to be able, for example, to do this ourselves? Um, what kind of capacity will the organization that hosts this secretariat need? So there is a number of all these questions that you would need to be honest about and really go through them so that when you say, ah, so the secretariat is now moving from JZ to this organization, you know that it is um, a well-calculated um, decision. Okay, so um, also establishing governance systems. Um, so maybe some of you know of these anecdotal stories. Um, in the late 80s and early 90s, when South Africa was transitioning um, from the previous um, um, government era, you know, there was a lot of um, international aid that was coming in. And so there were a, a lot of NGOs and some were just doing work, not really paying attention to governance um, issues. And a lot of them therefore had to close down because some people took advantage of that. So we always recommend that you really pay attention to that governance. Even if it's things like, you know, terms of reference, where each organization will say that, you know, um, this is what we'll adhere to, or this will be our code of conduct, etc. But do have those things um, set up and agreed to. And lastly, on phase four, creating management structures as well. If it works for you, have that container. If you want to call it a committee, have that committee. If you want to call it, um, you know, a task team, have that task team. But be clear in terms of the roles that structure will be playing and um, who that structure will be answering to, etc. So have those conversations and also look at the sustainability of your project 
and that's where I will end for now. And um, I guess this is the part where we ask for um, questions and also I'll be handing over to Douglas. Thanks, Alekwa. Um, yeah, we've run a little bit over time um, and I apologize for that, but I want to thank everybody for, um, for being here. We, we have this quote uh, that, uh, that we'd like to leave you with. Um, we do invite some questions for right now. Um, and of course, uh, if, uh, if you do have to leave, um, you, can, you can send us a question um, uh, to, there's an email address here, but you can also write to, uh, uh, you can contact, contact us on social media or write us at germany at collectiveleadership.com or South Africa at collectiveleadership.com. Um, I do also uh, want to say that um, this, uh, this, this presentation today was just a very brief introduction um, uh, to the dialogic change model. And we had teach a four-day course called the Art of Stakeholder Collaboration, which we're running, um, you know, just in two weeks' time. Lek will, will will be facilitating that in Cape Town, um, and at the end of next, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of June, um, I will be facilitating that same course here in Berlin. Um, we have as well um, one of those courses in uh, in Cambodia in August. And then again, back in Berlin and in Cape Town in November. This course, um, where we really do go through the dialogic change model in much greater detail, um, is excellent because of its practicality. We ask that participants bring, um, bring real situations that they're working on and stakeholder collaborations that they need to address um, and really apply them using the dialogic change model. And our pedagogy uh, is this mix of theory and practice in our courses. Um, of course, it's even better for these courses if you can bring the beginnings of your container. If you have uh, an idea about who really um, you need in your project or initiative to bring together um, to learn how to build um, a collaboration culture and also to build a stakeholder um, uh, system, uh, this course is a fantastic place to start. So I would recommend that if it's something that's of interest to, to any of you to take a look more closely um, at this uh, course offering for the rest of this year uh, and consider bringing um, a group or uh, at least some people who are responsible for building stakeholder systems uh, to this course. Um, I want to open up the, uh, the floor to any, any brief questions, but um, since we're already a little bit over time, um, if, if there are questions that you um, feel like you can just send out via email to either germany at collectiveleadership.com or to uh, Lulekwa has put her, her personal email at here, Lulekwa .kiba at collectiveleadership.com, please feel free to do so. Um, here are again are our, um, our contact email addresses if you'd like to be in touch with us. Uh, certainly, um, we'll be happy to, uh, to receive any questions that you have about the dialogic change model um, or if you are interested in, in really um, investing in yourself or in colleagues or in your stakeholder system um, to, uh, to learn how to use this uh, relational process management tool for building your stakeholder system for your multi-stakeholder and multi-sectoral collaboration initiative. Okay, I want to thank everybody um, for participating. And um, yeah, we're very happy to ha uh, have had you with us today. And thanks as well to Lekwa again for, for joining us from South Africa. Apologies for the uh, technical difficulties. I hope it was still enjoyable and informative. And uh, we hope to be able to do more of these events in the future. So thank you very much.